Well, hello again, everyone. It's great to be here with you. And looking out of the window, it's really nice to see the snowdrops and the crocuses and the daffodils popping up all over. It seems that spring is in the air. Well, as we look ahead to Easter, just over a month away now, this is a good time to start thinking about the impact of Jesus' sacrifice, not just in transforming our own lives, but for the wider implication for every person who has and will ever live. I'm really excited about this weekend's Gospel reading because it speaks about the life-changing promise that God makes to all peoples, that all who believe in Jesus may have everlasting life. And particularly, the verse that comes at the end, John 3, 16. It's one of my all-time favourite verses and probably the most famous verse in the whole Bible. And it's also known as the Gospel in a nutshell. Let's take a look at it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This verse condenses God's entire plan from the beginning of time and throughout Scripture into just 26 words. The words of God's mission to bring his creation back to himself. Now, as Jackie shared in her last message a couple of weeks ago, our triune God is a missional God. His love overflows to all peoples and his desire is to be in the most harmonious relationship with humanity for all of eternity. But the first humans didn't want that. They rebelled. They, in effect, booted God out of their lives. And as a result of that, they ended a beautiful relationship and they jeopardized a fantastic future. However, our loving Father wasn't ever going to let it end there. The word mission means send or sending. So God sent his son to make things right. As verse 17 of John 3 says, but he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus was sent to pay the price for our rebellion. In some ways, it looked like mission impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so Jesus' mission was a resounding success. But it didn't end there. And so once Jesus had returned in glory to be with the Father, Jesus and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to go on mission with his disciples. What was their mission? to make more disciples and make more disciples and make more disciples. It reminds me of Yul Brynner in the film, The King and I, where he says, etc., etc., etc. And that's what the business of making disciples is like. And so God's mission is now our mission. It's a great co-mission. It's his mission, but he lovingly includes us in his life-saving, disciple-making work. Much as I love verses 16 and 17 of John 3, it's important not to take them out of context from the rest of the passage. So let's go back and review those other verses. Verses 1 to 15, the intriguing story of Nicodemus. We'll start in verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, and no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked, How can this be? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven, ever gone into heaven, except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. There must have been a million words or more written about Nicodemus, so I'll try not to add too many more. But let us just quickly review the passage and see what John is trying to teach us here. We saw in verse 1 that Nicodemus was a high hegin, as we say in Scotland, a big kahuna, as they say in Hawaii. He was a high-ranking Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. And that is the best explanation for why he came looking for Jesus at night. Because no self-respecting Pharisee would want to be seen in broad daylight fraternizing with the enemy. I have a picture here of just that scene. Here's Nicodemus sneaking out at night to meet Jesus in secret. But Nicodemus' opening words to Jesus give his intentions away. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And we know from other scriptures that Nicodemus' contemporaries, the Pharisees, many of them thought Jesus was insane, or worse, that he was demon-possessed. Yet Nicodemus seems to see, def see Jesus in a different light. He sees him as a teacher from God. He sees him as someone whom God is with, not against. But it almost seems like Jesus is not listening to Nicodemus because he jumps straight in with words that seem, well, a little disconnected to what Nicodemus has said. He says this, he says, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. These words are strange to Nicodemus' ears. The word translated from the Greek into the English again, is anothen or anothen. And it can also mean from above. And if we look at the context of this chapter and also add in the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but 2,000 years of hindsight is even more wonderful. If we look at it in this context and from that perspective, we understand that this verse means born from above or spiritually reborn. But Nicodemus understands, misunderstands, sorry. He's thinking born again. And in his reply, we can sense his struggle to figure out what Jesus is really saying. He says, how can someone be born when they're old? 
Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Nicodemus' head is still very much thinking about the physical world. So Jesus tries to get him to refocus on what he's actually talking about. He's talking about spiritual matters. Verses 6 to 8. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Jesus is saying, I'm talking about a spiritual birth, Nicodemus. Don't you get it? But Nicodemus doesn't get it and says so. He says, how can this be? And I don't know if Jesus is getting a little frustrated at this point, especially given who he's speaking to, a learned man, a religious instructor. Because on the face of it, um, when Jesus replies, his words sound a little harsh. But I believe that Jesus is trying to help Nicodemus to figure it out for himself. And so he replies, You are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? In other words, you're a learned Pharisee. You know the books of the Old Testament inside out. Think, Nicodemus, where do water and the Spirit come together in the ancient writings of Scripture to bring a context promising a new beginning? Come on, I'm giving you some big clues here. Many scholars think that Jesus was prompting Nicodemus, egging him on to remember the incredible words written by the prophet Ezekiel six centuries earlier. Let's take a look at that scripture back in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A very famous passage which Nicodemus would surely know very well. He'd know it off by heart. And look at the clues here. A spectacular cleansing symbolized by water. The promise of a new spirit that transforms the human heart from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. This is a landmark prophecy of a future time when the very Holy Spirit will be placed inside of us and will move us to follow the expanded laws of the new covenant. It is talking about nothing less than a spiritual rebirth. Well, we don't know whether Nicodemus, this teacher of the law, this leading Pharisee, made the connection there and then, or whether he just went away and thought about it in the days and weeks ahead. We don't know because for the rest of his encounter with Jesus, he's silent. He's silent while Jesus says more about himself and more plainly than he perhaps has said at any time before. Nicodemus is silent while Jesus patiently explains that no one not even Jewish legends like Enoch, Moses and Elijah have been to heaven except himself who came from heaven. That he, the Son of Man, is telling him things that no one else could tell him. He's silent while Jesus explains to him that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness to heal all the Israelites who had been bitten by snakes, So Jesus would be lifted up to bring healing to all who have been poisoned by sin, 
for which the penalty is certain death. And he finishes by saying, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in me. And Nicodemus continues to remain silent while Jesus goes on to tell him the whole gospel in a nutshell. God's mission statement, John 3 and verse 16. Let's go back there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus must have gone away after his encounter with Jesus, with his head reeling, with his mind spinning, and his whole world gone all topsy-turvy. But this is not the last we hear of Nicodemus. We'll come back to him in a few moments. For now, I would like to wrap up this message by taking a quick, deep dive into this marvellous verse that they call God's mission statement. And the first part of it is this, for God, for God. Mission starts and finishes with God. He is the great initiator of mission. There's a German theologian who's very well known called Jürgen Moltmann, and this is what he said about this. It is not the church that has a mission of salvation to fulfill to the world. It is the mission of the Son and the Spirit through the Father that includes the church, creating a church as it goes on its way. The God who reveals himself in Jesus Christ comes to seek and save the lost, as indeed he sought and saved Nicodemus. This is God's mission. Next part, so loved. So loved. Love is the motivation for God's mission. In their love relationship, Father, Son and Holy Spirit <coughs> give, receive and share their love and it overflows out into the creation. We are so loved that God is always reaching out to us to include us in that relationship. He never gives up on us. We are so loved. Next part, the world. And the, the word translated here as world is cosmos. And in Greek, cosmos begins with a K. Cosmos means so much more than just the earth. It encompasses the universe and the whole human family, including all peoples currently alienated from or hostile to God. And there's a lot of those. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus takes this even further. He tells us to go into all the world, that's that word we've just looked at, cosmos, and preach the gospel to all creation. Another Greek word, katizai, part of my Greek. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Katizai means the whole creation. At the fall, the whole creation fell into bondage. But God so loves his creation that he includes everything in his redemption. Every part of the creation he desires to redeem and bring back to himself. Fourth part, that he gave. That he gave. You see, God is a missional God whose nature is love and whose action is giving. God loves us so much that he was willing to sacrifice himself by giving up his son, Jesus Christ. What sacrifices are we prepared to make to join him in his mission? What can we give up in terms of our time, our money, our prayers, 
and our whole selves. Next part. His one and only Son. His one and only Son. A man called Paul Borthwick wrote a book called Mission 316, God's One Word Invitation to Love the World. And this is what he said. Jesus is the pivot around which God's mission revolves. Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is the mediator, the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God but through him. And those are Jesus' words that he's quoting from John 14, verse 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the one and only way by which we can be reconciled to God. Next part. That whoever believes in him. That whoever believes in him. This is God's wonderful promise and it's open to everyone. Whoever believes. The mission of God sends an invitation to all. And the message is, understand my love, receive my forgiveness, and come, follow me. And that prompts a thought which is so beautifully expressed in Romans 10 and verse 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Next up. Shall not perish. Shall not perish. In this part of John 3.16, many place an overemphasis on the word perish instead of the two words that come before it shall not god's desire is to redeem his whole creation if possible to bring all humanity into loving relationship with him and as i said before with god all things are possible look at the hope that is included in the very next verse in john 3:17 for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And the final part of God's mission statement, but have eternal life. But have eternal life. God's mission is eternally significant for us all. His love, his sending, his including, and his sacrifice, they all call us into a relationship with him that will last forever. John 3.16 tells us that God has a master plan to save the whole world because he loves the whole world. And the verses before it, the story of Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus, well, they tell us, how God loves us so much that he's prepared to work with each and every one of us individually to bring us to salvation, whatever it takes. And the way he works is different with each and every one of us because we all are all created and wired differently. Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus was no chance encounter. I believe it was a divine Appointment. Nicodemus thought he was seeking Jesus out, but Jesus was calling him. The Holy Spirit was drawing him. What happened to Nicodemus? Well, in John chapter 7, we see a very different Nicodemus. We see a changed Nicodemus. The man who was so fearful of being seen with Jesus that he went looking for him in the dark now stands up in broad daylight and defends him. You can see that in John 7, verses 50 to 51. 
Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, that's the Pharisees, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? He stood up in front of his peers and defended Jesus Christ. Later, after Jesus' death, we hear about him again in John 19, verses 38 to 40. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders, a bit like Nicodemus. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And let's look at the next couple of verses. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 35 kilograms. That's a heavy load, 70 pounds or more. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Mission accomplished. You see, God knew exactly what he was doing when he sent Jesus on that divine appointment with Nicodemus. Nicodemus became one of Jesus' followers. And once God brought Nicodemus to himself, and once he reconciled all of us who call ourselves Christians to himself, when we left our old man or old woman dead and buried in the waters of baptism, well, what then? What next? The missional God takes us on mission with his son and his spirit to join with him in his business of making disciples. Some call it the Great Commission, but I call it the Great Co-Mission because God is a missional God and we are his co-workers. Let us pray. Almighty loving Father, we thank you. We thank you for revealing yourself to us as a missional God with a missional nature. We thank you that as a triune God who is love and as Father, Son and Holy Spirit who are eternally joined together in a love relationship. Your love overflows into your creation and your heart's desire is to redeem the human family who rebelled against you and reconcile the whole creation to yourself. Father, we also thank you for showing us that we have a part to play in your work, that in your love you have included us, even though you could surely do a much better job without us. Help us not to be faint-hearted or fearful like Nicodemus, because you go before us and you go behind us and you are always with us. And if you are for us, well, who can be against us? We thank you and pray this now in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. Later on this week, on Wednesday evening, Gavin Henderson will be bringing the latest episode in his Bible study series. And you can find a link to that on our website at gracecom.church or on our Grace Communion UK and Ireland Facebook page. And then, of course, we'll be back here again on YouTube next Sunday from 10.30am. See you next time. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.